Lenny Bruce, born October 13, 1925, in Mineola, Long Island, New York, is considered one of the most influential comedians of all time, as well as an outstanding social critic of the mid-20th century. He left a legacy that of a martyr for his punishment at the hands of those who believed his stand-up comedy was too obscene for its time. His routines in the late 1950s would sound almost quaint by today's standards, but to mainstream America, which got its comedy from My Love Lucy or Doris Day movies, Lenny Bruce's reverence was too much. As he gained notoriety, he focused his material on criticisms of the social and legal establishments, organized religion, and other controversial subjects. In April 1959, Bruce appeared on the nationally televised Steve Allen Show, where he was introduced as the most shocking comedian of our time. Bruce shocked his audiences, intentionally so, as one obscenity arrest followed another from 1961 to 1964. Bruce began a downward spiral leading to bankruptcy, drug addiction, and eventually his August 3, 1966 death from an overdose of morphine. Today's mainstream comedians continue to follow in his lead and are free to use language that once drew detectives to Bruce's shows. His pioneering efforts to move stand-up comedy beyond cliched one-liners to thoughtful commentary on important issues became part of the America mainstream. Stand-up comedy in the United States as we know today can be traced back to the middle stream monologues and early American burlesque shows. Comedians of this era often depended on fast-paced joke delivery, slapstick outrageous or lewd innuendo, and donned an ethnic persona Let's take a look at some of the OGs who formed stand-up into what it is today. Jack Benny was inducted into the Hollywood Walk of Fame with three stars, retiring with a star for television, motion picture, and for radio. He evolved from a modest success playing violinist on the vaudeville circuit to one of the leading entertainers of the 20th century. Bob Hope Hope began his career in show business in the early 1920s, initially as a comedian and dancer on the vaudeville circuit, before acting on Broadway. Hope began appearing on radio and in films starting in 1934. In addition to hosting the Oscar show 19 times, he made 57 tours for the United Service Organizations. Moms Mabley Billed as the funniest woman in the world, she tackled topics too edgy for many other comics of the era, such as racism, poverty, and sexism. In a career that spanned over six decades, Moms appeared in several films, recorded over 20 comedy albums, and eventually gained a new audience and variety shows in the 1960s and 70s. In the final year of her life, she had her first starring role in the motion picture, Amazing Grace. She is considered the first successful female stand-up comic. Lenny's parents divorced when he was a child. To support herself and her son, Sadie Schneider pursued a career in show business, working as a maid and a waitress. She developed a nightclub act based on impersonating movie stars. After spending time working on a farm in 1942, Leonard Schneider, he would later change his name to Bruce in 1947, volunteered for the Navy and served as a shell passer for three years off the coasts of North Africa, Italy, and southern France. In May 1945, after a comedic performance for his shipmates, in which he was dressed in drag, his commanding officers became upset. He defiantly convinced his ship's medical officer that he was experiencing homosexual urges. This led to his dishonorable discharge in July 1945. However, he had not admitted to or been found guilty of any breach of naval regulations and successfully applied to have his discharge changed to under honorable conditions by reason of unsuitability for the naval service. After a short period living with his father in California, Bruce settled in New York City, hoping to establish himself as a comedian. Bruce's show business career began as a paid amateur and staged amateur shows in New York City clubs. With some help from his mother, Lenny began doing impressions, one-liners, and movie parodies in small nightclubs. After several months of amateur gigs, Bruce landed a slot on the nationally broadcasted Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts. Bruce won Godfrey's Talent Contest and suddenly became a hot comedian, earning about $450 a week at clubs as Bruce describes the period of the mid-1950s in his autobiography. Four years working in nightclubs, that's what really made it for me, every night. 
doing it, doing it, doing it. Getting bored and doing it different ways. No pressure on you. So all the other different comedians are drunken bums who don't show up, so I could try anything. In 1951, Bruce met Honey Harlow, a stripper from Manila, Arkansas. They were married that same year, and Bruce was determined she would end her work as a stripper. The couple eventually left New York in 1953 for the West Coast. In his act, Lenny liked to expose racist attitudes by forcing his audiences to examine their own racial prejudices. On February 4th, 1961, performing before a packed house at Carnegie Hall, Bruce delivered what biographer Albert Goldman called the greatest performance of his career. The show, finishing after 2 in the morning, included classic bits in Las Vegas, the Ku Klux Klan, and JFK. In 1959, while taping the first episode of Hugh Hefner's Playboy's Penthouse, Bruce talked about his Navy experience and showed a tattoo he received in Malta in 1942. A performance at the Jazz Workshop in San Francisco on October 4, 1961, resulted in Bruce's first obscenity arrest and trial. The defense tried to demonstrate that Bruce's sketch was not offensive in the very liberal community of the district in which the Jazz Workshop was located. That Bruce's comedy was socially important and did not appeal to the prurient interest of the arresting officer or anyone else. George Carlin was arrested along with Bruce after refusing to provide identification. In the end, the jury agreed and acquitted Bruce on the obscenity charge. Less than two months later, he was charged with violating an Illinois obscenity statute during a performance at the Gate of Horn in Chicago. However, during his appeal in July 1964, the Illinois Supreme Court reversed Bruce's conviction, finding his speech protected by the First Amendment. In six weeks after the Chicago arrest, Bruce faced obscenity charges for a show at the Troubadour in Los Angeles. 1964, four New York City Vice Squad officers attended Bruce's performance at the Café O Gogo in Greenwich Village. The officers arrested Bruce and owner Howard Solomon following Bruce's 10 p.m. show. The jury indicted Bruce on the obscenity charge. A trial before a three-judge court in New York City that followed stands at a remarkable moment in the history of free speech. Despite support from noted writers, critics, educators, and politicians, in the end, the centers won, voting two to one. The court found Bruce guilty of violating New York's obscenity laws and sentenced him to four months in the workhouse. Continually harassed by the police, Lenny became depressed and paranoid. Further prosecutions for obscenity and his drug use drove him toward instability. By 1965, he was in debt. He stated that every time he got a gig, the local police, wherever he was, would threaten to arrest the club owner if Lenny went on stage. On June 25, 1966, the bankrupt Bruce gave his last performance at the Fillmore in San Francisco. Five weeks later, on August 3, 1966, police and press converged on his Hollywood Hills home. Lenny Bruce was dead of a morphine overdose. In 2004, Comedy Central listed Bruce at number 3 on its list of the 100 greatest stand-ups of all time, placing above Woody Allen 4th and below Richard Pryor 1st and George Carlin 2nd. Pryor said that hearing Bruce for the first time changed his life, while Carlin said that Bruce was a brilliant comedian who influenced him as much as a man in his moral thinking and attitudes as he did as a comedian. Mm -hmm. I had to learn to stop caring about people not yeah. laughing. Because the, the idea of comedy, really, is not everybody should be laughing. Right. It should be about 50 people laughing and 50 people horrified. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's supposed to be people that get it and people that don't get it.